Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Crisis and Recovery Enhancement TA Center. We are thrilled that you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Dr. Eliana Ramirez. I am the project director for the Crisis and Recovery Enhancement TA Center. It is a real honor and joy to welcome you to our first webinar. This is about motivational interviewing. This is session one of a two series learning opportunity. This is going to be presented by Christina Wade, LCSW. We will start off with the disclaimer. Uh, we are funded by the Mental Health Services Act to provide TA and technical assistance to 58 counties through the Department of Healthcare Services. What we're about to share here does not necessarily represent the views of Department of Healthcare Services nor that of the Center for Applied Research Solutions where I work, but we do hope that you will appreciate what is about to be shared. So as I was just mentioning, the CARE TA Center is uh, funded through DHCS to provide training and technical assistance to the 58 MHSA funded county programs across the state of California. We focus on the crisis continuum of care and justice diversion efforts. We offer a variety of training and technical assistance resources and invite you to visit our website where you can learn about how to submit a TA request, where you can access our resource library and a variety of other services that are available to you. Thank you so much for being here today. So it is my honor to introduce to you our trainer, Christina Wade. Uh, Christina is somebody that I have had the opportunity to work with for quite a while, and um, it's really an honor to have her here as our first presenter. Christina is certified in motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy. With a clinical range of experience, including justice involvement, addiction, suicide prevention, crisis management, and homelessness. Christina earned her MSW, Master's of Social Work, from the University of Texas at Austin in 2006 while working for the Center for Social Work Research. She began her career at the University of California, San Diego, working as the senior clinical social worker for pre-release services in various California state prisons. In 2010, she accepted a position working directly for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, specifically San Quentin State Prison. Christina worked a total of six years in the California penal system. While employed at San Quentin, Christina earned her LCSW, License of Clinical Social Work. In 2012, she transitioned to the Veterans Affairs Palo Healthcare System as the forensics expert for addiction treatment services, working with veterans suffering from addiction, PTSD, and mood disorders. In 2014, she transitioned to supervising within emergency services at the University of California, working out of San Francisco General Hospital. Christina left the UC to work as the East Bay Suicide Prevention Coordinator at Veterans Affairs Northern California Healthcare System before taking on her current role as Senior Program Analyst for the Rocky Mountain Merrick for the VA Suicide Prevention. She is an incredibly astute clinician who has worked with a variety of populations regarding the crisis continuum of care and justice diversion, but she also has that special sauce of being a researcher as well. So without further ado, Christina, welcome and thank you very much. So hi everyone, it's great to be here today. I just want to take a minute to acknowledge the fact that there is a lot happening right now in our country, and I appreciate you guys logging in to choose to be here with me today. So as I started putting this training together, um, I was really reminded of my early years as a clinician. So the first six years of my career, they were spent in the field at San Quentin State Prison. And I have to say it was those early years where I really began to grasp the power of and the genuine need for inspirational connection, right? I think the yearning that we have as human beings to feel heard and understood, uh, to really feel worthy of having someone in our corner. And so for us, a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how to be a provider in someone's corner, right? How to hear our clients when they're ready to make a change and how to meet them with empathy in a way that inspires them to keep going for themselves. Let's just start with kind of a quick overview of how motivational interviewing, or MI as I will also call it throughout this training. So how is it defined? So motivational interviewing is a directive client-centered counseling style that we use for eliciting behavior change by helping our clients explore and resolve their ambivalence. So MI operates under the assumption that ambivalence is totally normal, right? It's natural for people to have mixed feelings about 
changing things in their lives, especially when those things may have actually brought them to you as their provider. So as we move through uh, our session today, what I would encourage you to do is think about the information that we're talking about from a personal and professional place. So how would you be feeling if you were the client? And how do you think your client is feeling sitting with you? Let's check in just about our learning objectives a bit. So what I'll be going over with you guys are things like the key principles and processes of motivational interviewing. So things like the overall spirit and philosophy of MI, uh, how to recognize and reinforce change talk. And by change talk, I mean those moments in which our patients let us know verbally and even non-verbally, they're experiencing conflict, right? There's a problem that they're having um, and it's in conflict with a goal or a value in their life. So there are changes that they want to work on. We'll talk about how to elicit and strengthen that change talk, um, how to roll with resistance, negotiating change plans. We're really going to spend some time getting into the theory of MI so you can understand its strategy and its intention, especially before our session next week, when we apply this stuff, when we start practicing this knowledge. So additionally, we will dive into some of the methods and core skills that are used in motivational interviewing. You'll hear me talk a lot about the ORs at this time. So it's our open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And then lastly, uh, we'll spend time learning really all throughout the training, how to detect change talk. So there's actually growing evidence that change talk has a predictive relationship with behavior change. And while I haven't, I haven't found a ton of research that I guess clearly indicates like the frequency. So like the specific percentage of the predictive nature, but what I have found and what I've experienced as a clinician is that the strength of our clients change talk is the, it's the very best predictor for the likelihood that actual changes are going to be made. So why is motivational interviewing important to us as practitioners? So I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine uh, the other day, actually, she's still in direct practice, but doesn't have a ton of background working with folks who aren't ready to change just simply because of her specialty and how she gets her referrals. But she asked me, which I thought was pertinent for this, you know, she said, what's your, what's your opinion about motivation anyways? Like you're certified in MI. What do you think? Do you think motivation matters in terms of effective communication? Or is there another way to get our clients on board with doing what we need them to do? And so in the moment, kind of aside from honestly cringing a little bit, um, thinking about getting a client to do what I need them to do, it made me really reflect on why motivational interviewing was so important to my work and my practice. Um, effective communication, which is largely the backbone of motivational interviewing, it's not a ploy to get our clients to do something for us, right? It's a means to help our clients figure out what matters to them how to change their behavior in a way that they desire for it to change. Motivation can improve our clients' lives because it's a bridge to things like improved treatment adherence and better clinical outcomes. When you're motivated, you have drive for change. You have efficacy to maintain change. And then even more than that, effective communication, so using our techniques of MI uh, in our practice, it's also a way for us as providers to protect ourselves from burnout. So I think really learning how to understand what drives our clients, reminding them that they're in the driver's seat. It helps with job satisfaction and it prevents burnout because it keeps the onus on our clients and not on us as their providers because we already feel enough pressure. You know, it helps with overall continuity because good communication lacks judgment. It's not one-sided advisement. Good communication really maintains good rapport. Uh, It keeps everyone coming back. So that's why MI is important uh, to our practice. So I think a good place for us to start actually is to jump into a case right away. Something to kind of put motivation into perspective for us before we get into the nitty gritty of motivational interviewing. So motivation generally, it's a really important mindset for us to understand. And it's really the heart and the aim of our skills in MI. So I will say throughout this training, I'm going to do my best to give you guys case examples um, for any kind of major things we talk about, especially from theory. I've just found that it's helpful to have an example of something from real life when I'm learning something new. So I hope that's helpful. But let's get into a case. So we have a 40-year-old male of Hispanic descent. He's living alone and he's slowly drifting away from his family and friends because of substance use. So this man... He goes into the 
ED because his arm is in emergency department because his arm is infected from shooting up. He's using heroin. So when the doctor comes in, the two of them start talking about his use of heroin. And now this is something that this guy has struggled with for years, right? He's never at the time though, he's never fully felt like he's able to quit. And he tells the doctor that. But instead of listening and exploring the why um, behind why this client hasn't been able to quit, the doctor starts listing off all the reasons this man should stop using heroin, all of the ways that substances can negatively impact his life, and all of the risks associated with opiate use, all of which are totally true, but none of really, none of them get through to him. So this man basically starts answering with a blanketed, yeah, yeah, I, I know, doc, you know, like, I, I know all of this already. I don't need the lecture. So this attending, uh, the ED doctor, he decides to try a different approach. He starts listing off different interventions that they could try. Stuff like uh, a referral to treatment or even what about ORT, medications, opiate replacement. How about Suboxone or Methadone to help with your cravings? And the client again kind of says, yeah, yeah, I've heard all this stuff before. I'm aware. Like, thanks, but no thanks. I just need help with my infection so I can get out of here. So the ED doctor gets intended to and the client leaves. The doctor is frustrated, right? The client feels super frustrated. Not much was accomplished aside from treating the infection. So from the ED, this man starts walking home and on the way uh, he calls and makes plans to connect with his dealer. So he's actually out of heroin at this point. And honestly, the ED visit stressed him out. So they meet up. This man climbs in the back seat of his dealer's car, which is really where they routinely met to exchange kind of cash for drugs. And his dealer tells him like, hey man, you know, I just, I just got a new shipment in. This is a new product. I've got some time to kill. You want to try it out with me? So they do. They shoot up. They get high. Well, while he's sitting in the back seat of this car, um, of his dealer's car, kind of leaning back, not really enjoying his high, but happy to not be feeling uh, withdrawal symptoms, happy to not be feeling the stress, at least in the moment of that ED visit anymore. The man sees this face of a little girl walk up to the window where he's sitting in the back seat, and it takes him by complete surprise. So he realizes in the moment, the car that he's sitting in has actually been parked in front of a church. This is in a city. An evening mass is just let out. So he makes eye contact with this little girl who he actually draws like immediate reference to as himself. And I'll get into that a little bit, but he notices the fear in her eyes when they look at each other. So he tries to sit up, um, to look a little less out of it, but he can't. He's he's just too high. So he stays there for a while longer, kind of slumped in the back seat, uh, looking out the window, watching families walk by, kind of holding his breath that not another child walks up and sees him sitting back there. And eventually he sobers up enough to leave, and he does. So as he's walking home, he can't shake the look of fear in that little girl's eyes. It reminded him so much of the first time that he saw his dad use. The first time that he saw his father passed out on the couch unresponsive, he wasn't aware of how much that sight scared him as a child, and it touched him. Something about that interaction really, really hit him deep. And I use this as, as an example because sitting in the back seat of his dealer's car that day, that was the last day this man ever used. And I want you to think about that as we move through the whole session today. Think about the power of motivation. Because as we move through, it's never to be underestimated. So I thought we could do an audience poll. This is the era of COVID. I want to make sure you guys aren't sleeping in the background. In thinking about this scenario that I just discussed, what do you think the underlying motivation was for this man to get clean? Was it his interaction that he had with the emergency room doctor? Was it the little girl that he saw through the car window? Or do you think it was his childhood memory of his father's substance use that motivated him? Or was it a combination of his interaction with the little girl coupled with his childhood memory? 93% combination of his interaction with the little girl and his childhood memory. And you know what? Like, so I changed some things around. I want all these examples to remain, remain very anonymous to people that I have met in my life. Um, but I would say that, th that this client would agree. It was a combination of his interaction with the little girl alongside the childhood memory that triggered his motivation. The look in her eyes became really personal for him. Uh, the feeling that he got as a result of that interaction is what motivated him to change. And it's that feeling that we're wanting to find as providers, 
right? Because it's that feeling that we can highlight when we're working uh, through our clients in bivalence, whether it be defining a behavior change goal or working towards really a targeted behavior change. We want to build off of our clients' emotion, off of their feelings, because when it's personal, it's meaningful. And when it's meaningful, it's much, much more likely to change. So when you think about it, we're told from a young age what's good and what's bad, right? Like what we should be doing versus what we shouldn't be doing. The only problem is that with these messages, there's rarely any acknowledgement that we live in a world where the don't do's happen all the time. So as clinicians, we need to think about, and one of the biggest things we need to think about is we really can't expect to tell our clients, don't do that, if we know they're going to leave our office and interact with the world where the don't do's happen all around them. And even more, where those don't do's are something they may already be doing um, and they may continue to do them, right? So how do we reconcile that? Um, How do we find common ground so we're not alienating our clients, but rather we're working with them as a team? How do we instill motivation from a place of internal drive and not from a place of external imposition? So we've all been exposed also uh, to change, right? To the need to change, um, or rather to the need to be able to adapt to change, really since the day we were born. The hard part about change is it's not one size fits all. Right? The need to change can be really triggering for certain people. And the desire to change without the ability to easily follow through, it can manifest into feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, depression. It can lead to crisis. It can lead to suicidality. There's a saying, actually, that, that my dad used to tell me as a, as a child often. He said this all the time. It's a lot easier said than done. Right? It's a lot easier to tell someone to stop behaving in a way that's problematic versus be that someone trying to figure out how to stop behaving in a way that's problematic to their life. And this is another really important concept that we as providers need to understand because just like motivation, change is really powerful. So I want you to think, and we'll pause for like 10 seconds, but think for a moment about something in your life where an experience was so impactful that it actually shaped your journey. It actually contributed to where you are today. I'm going to Count to 10 in my head and then we'll think, but think about a moment that was, that was that impactful to you. So hopefully everyone was able to think of that moment. So chances are when you were thinking of that moment just now, uh, you remembered when it happened and where it happened and how it happened. You probably remember why it happened, how it felt. So that right there, that's the point of origin of change. And the premise of motivational interviewing, it's largely rooted in aspects of a theory that's related to the trans theoretical model for change, right? So in purpose, for purposes of our training, we're really just going to focus on pre-contemplation and contemplation today, because that's really where MI is at its best. It's where the skills are focused. In the 1980s, there were two well-known alcoholism researchers, Prochaska and Di Clemente, and they introduced this six-stage model of change to help providers really understand their clients with addiction problem, what motivates them to change, right? So that's where a lot of MI came from. Uh, Their model wasn't really based in abstract theory, but rather it was on their personal observations of how people went about modifying behaviors, uh, problem behaviors, such as smoking or overeating, uh, drinking, anything and everything addiction, really how and what made people change. Well, I'm not going to review every stage in their model. We're going to really focus on pre-contemplation and contemplation. I thought this could be kind of a cool opportunity to think about theory from a place of application. So what would we be looking for in real life? What would we hear? So let's think about another case example. Let's say that we're working with a 34-year-old Caucasian female. She comes in to see us after discharging from PES, from psych emergency. So she actually ended up in PES after her landlord told her that if she didn't clean out her apartment, she would be evicted because it had become just too much of a health hazard. And when faced with that news, kind of this lack of control, forced potential change, she began screaming uncontrollably that she was going to kill herself. She never wanted to be homeless again. So her landlord, not really knowing what to do, he called the police uh, and she was brought into PES for further evaluation. Shortly after, though, it's determined, you know, her suicidality really was secondary to this housing crisis. 
And thus she's referred to us. So here we are, we're receiving a client. Um, she's had recent suicidality and behavior escalation, recent crisis. How do we approach her? What are we listening for? Um, what's our strategy from a place of pre-contemplation if that's where she's at? So let's say I'm meeting with her, uh, we're sitting her down and I'm telling her all the options that, uh, that, we have, that we have to offer as a case management program, all the options that the city has, all the cleaning that we can help with in terms of her apartment. Well, so if she's in pre-contemplation, she's probably going to come back at me with something like, uh, whoa, 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 like I'm just here because the doctor in PES said I had to work with you if I want to keep my housing, right? I don't have a problem. I just don't want to be homeless again. But my landlord, he's the one who needs to get off my back. I don't need to change. I've been like this my whole life. No, no need to change. Right. So that's pre-contemplation. I'm not really viewing this as a problem. And thus, I'm not really seeing the need to change my behavior. So let's think about what she would say if she were in more of a contemplation stage, a stage where she might actually be open to talking about both sides of the problem. She may even talk about the pros and cons of change, but she doesn't really know what to do next. So in contemplation, she may say something like, uh, well, you know, I, I guess my apartment is pretty cramped and I don't, I don't like all of the bugs. I don't like the cockroaches, but I, I don't want to get rid of my stuff. It's my stuff, right? It's all I have. So in these first two stages, pre-contemplation and contemplation, there's always a common phrase that we're likely going to hear. And it's one that I'm sure we've all heard many, many times. It's that word, but. So it's, yes, I know I need to throw things out, but what if I need that something that I've thrown out in the future? What if the very next day I need it? So now let's for a moment, take the client out of this situation and focus on what pre-contemplation and contemplation may feel like for us as providers. We're doing this in real life and we're, you know, half of, half of the therapeutic relationship. So here I am, I'm a provider willing, ready, and able uh, to help. And I have this client that needs their house cleaned out, but she can't really emotionally handle what needs to happen. She's not really acknowledging it as a problem. So what do I do, right? As a provider, I'd be worried. Um, I would be frustrated. I, I would probably be at a loss in many ways. Like, What do I do to keep her housed when she hasn't taken any steps necessary to stay in her home? And it really doesn't feel like she's ready. So in these moments, it's really important for us to keep perspective and find empathy around our client's contemplation. So it's how can we find and understand how our client feels right now? I could reflect something back to this client like, you know, I hear this is really hard for you because it feels like I'm asking you to throw part of yourself out. This is your stuff. You've worked really hard for it. It's important to you. Right. By doing this, we're inadvertently telling the client, we understand the conflict you're going through and we want to understand it. We're showing her that we can empathize, um, that we understand the struggle she's going through. And again, we're interested in the feelings around this problematic behavior for her, that we want her to keep exploring it with us. I think it's easy when to, to think about uh, next steps for a client who comes in ready to change, right? Someone who's in preparation or action there are clear indicators for what to do when someone comes in ready for treatment. But what about when they're not ready? What about when they're stuck in pre-contemplation or contemplation? So this is where motivational interviewing comes in. Um, and it has the ability really to enhance your practice and your rapport. I mean, it can be magic for you and your client, you know, by using MI techniques, you're able to work with your client to figure out for themselves how to move closer to defining their goal and thinking about possible steps, preparation, to attain their behavior change. So now for some of the fun stuff, we're going to be getting into the principles of MI, the processes of its practice, and the skills that we use when we're working with our clients from this place of strategy. So there is this concept that we all struggle with, and it's referred to as the writing reflex. So this concept, resisting the writing reflex, is a very, very important component to motivational interviewing. It's hard to, to fight the urge that, that I think a lot of us have to, tell, to not tell our clients what to do. We've trained. We've trained really hard. We've gone to school. We've taken licensure exams. We feel like we know what's best for our clients, right? And we've worked really hard to learn our craft. 
So we have strong feelings about what behavior should be, in our opinion, changing. But at the end of the day, people change when they're ready to change. I think one of the biggest ways that uh, motivational interviewing differs from just a client-centered communication approach is that we go into it with this strategy, right? So the strategy is to try to help our patient realize how their problem behavior is in conflict with an important value or goal that they have in their life. So going back to this woman who is at risk of losing her housing, it's how is her problem behavior hoarding? How is that in conflict with important goals or values that she has in her life, staying housed? So we're asking her questions in order to elicit from from her. And this isn't just us telling her why she needs to change her behavior, but it's instead having her tell us what fundamental behavior in your life needs to change. We're trying to subtly, by using reflective listening, affirmations, asking open-ended questions, summarizing, all of those MI skills we're going to get into. We're trying to have our clients tell us why they think they need to change. Okay, so understanding motivation. What does that mean? It's important to understand our clients' own motivation. What drives them? What do they care about? Uh, What makes them want to change? And with this principle, it's really important to remember that the opposite of understanding is arguing. So we want to do what we can to avoid arguing with our clients because arguing, using the word like but with your client, right? Like, yeah, I I get where you're you're coming from, but, right? It elicits more of that, that writing reflex of us wanting to tell them what to do. And I actually have an example of this um, that comes to mind in terms of avoiding arguments and really understanding client motivation. So when I was supervising out of the uh, emergency department, one of my main duties was to screen all of the patients who engaged with my case managers for really for readiness and motivation, right? Were they going to follow through for our services? So we only worked with high utilizers of the emergency department, most of whom were homeless, most of whom were struggling with addiction all of whom were medically decompensating. And this one woman who has actually since passed away, but it's just someone that I will always remember. So she always frequented the ED and she struggled so much with alcohol, but nothing that I said ever seemed to motivate her for change. Nothing that I said or did could get her to come back to see me after discharge. And I think it's largely when I look back, it's because I was trying to win an argument with her. You know, I would tell her, you know, ma'am, like if you would only be open to sobriety, um, if you would only be open to our services, right? So if, if, if it, it never worked, she never came back to see me. So about a year uh, after seeing her in the emergency room, nearly every week, I got a page that she was back. I ran, I ran down. I was super determined to help her. There was just something so innocent and vulnerable about her that I found myself worrying about her safety and her life often, actually. Well, so this day, it just so happens that my my hands were super dry. And I had this small bottle of hand lotion with me when I approached her. And man, did her eyes light up. I had never seen her care about anything that I had to offer. But she looked right at that bottle of lotion when I approached her. And I noticed it. So instead of talking uh, about all the things my team could offer her or all the things that she should be doing, we talked about the smell of this lotion and what it meant to her. I rolled with her resistance, with her ambivalence. And I became genuinely interested in a way that I didn't at the time realize I was missing, but in a way that helped me finally understand what motivated her to change, which was remembering her family. It was feeling close to her mom. So she told me these stories about her childhood and the meaning of that particular smell to her how she and her mom would come up with all of these different stories based on the smells that they would smell together while they were riding the bus. And she told me the scent of the lotion that I was wearing that day in the ED, that's what her mom used to smell like. So slowly she started to trust me. And over time, uh, she started coming in to see me more regularly. And I didn't promise her things like housing or sobriety. I offered her the same bottle of hand lotion that she smelled that very first day. Every single time she came in to see me, She got another travel-sized bottle of lotion. My team had them. We gave them, we gave most of our toiletries to most of our patients. Um, It was the best and most effective method of engagement that I had to offer her. And this woman over time, she started to actually listen to my questions. She became interested in talking to me about her life and her mom and her family. She started talking about things she may want to change. We built rapport. And soon we were able to start thinking about the benefits of living indoors, which is a goal that she came up with all on her own. And I have to say it was so sweet because 
her reason for wanting to live indoors was she wanted to continue feeling close to her mother. She had found so much comfort in the stories that she'd been sharing with me. She hadn't thought about that stuff in years, that she wanted to keep those smells close to her because plain and simple, they made her think of her mom and they made her feel better. It gave her motivation in areas really just for living life that she hadn't felt in a really, really long time. And picking up on a small bottle of hand lotion and the way that her eyes lit up was the only thing that helped guide me after a year in terms of the types of questions that I could ask her while attempting to elicit change talk from her. And I wanted to include this example because you just, you never know where your client's motivation is going to come from. So you always have to be paying attention to how things touch them. Okay, so let's talk about listening uh, with empathy next. This is a big one that I'm sure you've probably picked up on uh, thus far. I have talked about empathy quite a bit, but there's a lot of layers to this concept. So what do I mean by listening with empathy? So reflective listening is an important part of motivational interviewing, but overall empathy is bigger than that. Empathic listening, it's the effort that we make as clinicians to understand our client's perspective, to convey to them that we hear them, right? So I think sometimes empathy can be confused with a demonstration of kindness um, or agreements, uh, acceptance, just simply having concern for your patient. But empathy isn't sympathy. So it's not poor you. It's not, I've had the same problem, right? It's actually being interested uh, with a neutral curiosity for our patient's ideas and attitudes regarding all sides of the behavior change that's being proposed. Because remember, in MI, we're going into all of our client interactions with a strategy. So in a way, it's the notion that we want our patients to feel like we get them. So for this woman that I discussed, I didn't get her until after she told me about her life. And honestly, the role that different smells played in her motivation to become housed, which was ultimately to feel closer and to remember her mom. So there's this concept in uh, in MI, and it's largely in this area of listening with empathy. It's called rolling with resistance. Think of it as rolling with ambivalence, right? It's a staple of motivational interviewing. So it's rather than fight back, we're letting go of the resistance and we're trying to find creative methods for letting that resistance go. And even more, uh, we're trying to respect the resistance in a way that brings us to better understand and portray our empathy. So something that I found myself constantly saying when I worked in addiction, especially with my clients who were admitted to medicine because they had doctors talking at them um, most days, right? I'd go in, I'd see them in bedside, see them bedside and I just get that same old groan so many times like, oh, not another provider. None of you people understand, you know? So I wouldn't push treatment most of the time. I would ask about the other side. Uh, I'd say something like, uh, it sounds like you've been made well aware of all the bad things alcohol has to offer your life. So tell me instead, what are the good parts? Why do you like drinking? What's helpful about it for you? Right. And it threw people uh, pretty quickly when I would roll with that resistance because they didn't know what to say next. They were ready to fight. Uh, They weren't expecting to engage, but the craziest thing would happen when I asked about the benefits of using. So my patients would answer, they would tell me the good things, but they would often quickly follow up with all of the negative impacts of substance use. They brought, and not all the time, but most of the time, honestly, they brought themselves to change talk uh, when they realized, I hope that they had a provider who wasn't going to push an agenda. I was just there to listen to them, to meet them where they wanted to start, even if that meant using safely. So empowerment, which is actually my personal favorite empowerment, I should say is not cheerleading. It's actually quite the opposite. So patient empowerment is centered on the belief that patients should be in control of their own care and the behavioral changes to adherence uh, and, and adherence to therapies, they can't really be achieved unless patients internalize the need for self change. They have to be on board. Right. What I found over the years is that if our patients can truly feel that we believe in their ability to change, there's a better outcome. They're more likely to change. And then even better, if they believe in the fact that they can change, they're much, much more likely to change if they're believing in themselves. Empowerment is really the reason I would say it's my favorite is. It's just amazing to watch someone start to believe in themselves and start to make changes that they've set for themselves based on things that matter in their own lives. 
I would actually say it's probably the biggest thing I miss, um, given that I'm not in direct practice anymore, but it's a, it's a really, really amazing part of uh, motivational interviewing. So aside from key principles, I also wanted to briefly touch about just what we're talking about when it comes to theory. So now we're going to start like labeling things and defining stuff. So you guys really know what this is. So the four main processes that make up motivational interviewing. The first process, engaging, is just like it sounds, right? It's what we do when we're building rapport with our clients. So when we're engaging our clients, we want to think of stuff like uh, how comfortable is this person in talking to me? How supportive and helpful am I being? Uh, Do I understand this person's perspectives and their concerns? Do I feel like this is a collaborative partnership? So we're always asking ourselves, how can I best engage my client right now? And then focusing. So focusing is essentially the what in terms of the process of motivational interviewing. It's all about finding a clear direction uh, and goal when there's lingering ambivalence. So it's working to clear up the gray area. Some of the things that we want to think about when we're focusing are what Goals for change does this person really have? Do I have different aspirations for change as opposed to my, my patient, right? As opposed to my client, are my, are my goals different? Uh, are we working together for a common purpose? Does it feel like we're moving together? Or are we in different directions? Do I even have a clear sense of where we're going? This is where this, the, the changes or this, the stages of change come in. So where is this person when it comes to their change, right? Are they in pre-contemplation or contemplation? And if so, How do I use my MI skills? How do I approach this with strategy? So third is evoking. So this is really where the strategy uh, of MI comes into play with regards to our MI skills. Uh, This is where we become selective in starting to collect all these little golden nuggets of change talk from our clients. And once we have a handful of them, we respond to their change talk within the context of our MI strategy. And I want you to keep this process in mind, actually, as we get into our ORs because this is largely where the techniques of evoking come in handy. So really keep this process in mind as we move forward with the slides. So generally though, some of the things to think about when you're evoking your client is what's my client client's own reason for change. It feels like they're super ambivalent. Is that reluctance more about my client's confidence in being able to change? Or is it more about their overall motivation level? What change talk am I hearing? Uh, Am I steering too far or too fast in one direction? Another really big thing to think about with evoking is the writing reflex, right? Is the writing reflex pulling me too hard? Am I starting to argue with my client about needing to change? And then lastly, planning, which is really the the how part of the process. Um, So the how are we going to get this done, right? How are we going to achieve your targeted behavior? So in planning, we're wanting to develop our clients' skills, really. Uh, We want to start planning for action, removing barriers, exploring uh, sources for outside support. So we're going to get more into planning, I would say, when we get into the change planning section in the next few slides. But I want to make sure you guys have an overview of the processes before we move into that nitty gritty, because we're about to get into the weeds a little bit more. So what is resistance? To begin, resistance is not sustained talk. It's not someone telling us that they want to stay the same. Resistance is behavioral. It's a problem in the therapeutic relationship. It's our biggest signal that it's time to switch gears. So time and time again, um, again, when I was working in addiction, I would shake my patient's hand and we would walk back to my office and I would hear like a different iteration of this blanketed statement often. It would be kind of like, I don't even know why I'm here. You know, I honestly don't drink that much. My wife or my mother or my husband or whoever, but my wife for this example, they're just being dramatic. They're making me come in. Right. So if I wanted to butt up against the resistance, I would say something like, well, how much are you drinking? (laughs) Right. Like I'm not telling them they're wrong, but at the same time, I'd basically be completely invalidating their frustration with the fact that they're in my office right now. So if I wanted to highlight the ambivalence in a way that promotes change talk, I would probably use an amplified reflection uh, in this situation. And we are about to get into reflections, but just for this example, just so you know what it is, I would probably say something like, okay, so alcohol is not a problem in your life at all. Your wife has no leg to stand on, right? So I would make the the statement a little bit bigger, um, hoping that my client disagrees with me so that I could highlight any change talk that may come about. Well, it's not a problem for me, but I guess it is for my wife you know, and I can build off of that. Okay. I see. So I hear alcohol is a problem in your marriage, right? So it's figuring out how to work within our client's belief system in a way that 
helps to highlight problematic behaviors, alcohol, and how those behaviors are, again, in conflict with a value or a life goal, my marriage. When we talk to our patients in the MI framework, we're always looking for change talk. So change talk is client language with movement towards change. It could be a desire. I want to stop using, right? Or an ability. I think I can stop using. It could be reasons. I'm going to lose my job if I don't stop using, right? Or needs. Um, I need to stop using. It could be commitment. I'm going to stop using this time. Or activation. I'm willing to try. It could be taking steps. Uh, I've already told my brother, I'm getting back into treatment. It's happening. You know, so again, it's not our job to convince our client, but rather it's our job to find the part of their belief that's in favor of change. That's the change talk. What in their speech is talking about change? That's what we're trying to find. We've covered at this point the spirit of motivational interviewing, trying to collaborate with our clients, evoke their desire to change, and really emphasize their autonomy in being able to do so. So I think now is a great time to get into the weeds, right? We're going to dive into the oars of MI a bit. And these are our core skills of motivational interviewing that really we use. We've talked a lot about them, but I think this is now really let's define them, kind of drive things home. So one thing that I would highlight from the get-go as we get into our ORs and kind of thinking about the information actually that we just covered about resistance. So while change is hard, it's not because of resistance. It really does come back to a lack of motivation. It comes back to that place of ambivalence. And the problem with ambivalence is that it's super uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's anxiety provoking, you know, it's hard to sit with it. So a lot of times we're meeting our clients after years of procrastination. So the core skills that we're about to talk about These are what help us unjar our patients from that pre-contemplation and contemplation. So what do the ORs stand for? Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And let's start with open-ended questions. These are questions that can't be answered with one word. So no yes or no questions. So it's asking something like, how do you feel versus are you in pain? It's asking a client to describe for you how they're feeling versus yes or no, are you in pain? When you provide clients with actually with like a hard stop question, like, are you in pain? It's really difficult to engage in conversation in which we're trying to elicit change talk. We want our clients to be talking more than we're talking. Uh, Another example could be, what role does the emergency department play in your life versus don't you want to stop coming into the ED so much, right? Or how might your health stop you from doing what you want to do? Or one that I always used to love asking what do you think might happen if you don't make a change? You know, so we do our best to ask open-ended questions because we want our clients to tell us what's on their mind. What are their reasons for wanting to change? It's relaying to our clients, look, at the end of the day, it's your choice about whether or not to change this. I'm just here to help you define your options. You're the boss of your life. And while plenty of people may think or be telling you what you should be doing, it's up to you to choose. Only you have the choice to act. So our goal with open-ended questions is really to ask questions that open things up for discussion, right? And I should say, actually, of course, also, we're going to be giving our patients advice. Um, I think it's expected. It's part of our work. It's just that it's so much more powerful when we can have our advice tied to something that our client has identified themselves as important to them. That's when they really get on board. And that's when us as their provider we're really harnessing the power of our advice if it matters to our client. So even more, actually, one other thing I want to mention, we should think about the fact that when we're giving advice, we can and we should always do it within the premise of these MI techniques. So again, our goal is to help people get motivated to change, assess where they're at, and then when they're ready to change, that's when we start giving some of that advice all the while we're using an MI approach. So if I have thoughts about something, I would say something like, so I've got some ideas about what I think might be helpful for you. How do you feel about it if we talked about that for a little bit, right? I keep, it's our job to keep the clients in the driver's seat. How do you feel about that? Okay, so now affirmations. These are based on really the power of positive reinforcements. So affirmations are statements that we can relay when we notice positive changes in our clients. So saying something like, uh, this is hard work that you're doing. 
or it took a lot of courage for you to come in here today noting that you had a dirty UA, urine analysis. Really highlighting accomplishments, achievements, efforts, positive things, right, that our clients are doing while working towards change. We want to help them learn that they have the ability to change their behavior on their own for themselves, to know really that they have the ability to maintain those changes and the power of positive reinforcement, really finding a way to affirm our clients. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be about their problem behaviors. It could be about something that they're doing well in their lives, that they've maintained stable behavior. You could say something like, I've, you know, you've really been making an effort to harness your emotion lately. I've, I've noticed it. You're doing a really great job. You know, finding ways to affirm our clients is a key skill of motivational interviewing. One warning, though, (laughs) it's important to keep your affirmations genuine and meaningful. People have a pretty good BS meter, so you don't want to provide positive reinforcement to something that's overly trivial in their lives, right? Like, make sure that there's meaning behind your reinforcements. You want everything that you're saying to be authentic below the surface. Have, Have your affirmations be below the surface. Okay, so our third core skill, arguably, at least in my opinion, the most important skill in MI, the hardest one to learn as well. This is understanding uh, what your client is thinking and feeling and saying it back to your client in a way that continues to move the conversation forward. So this could be a client that comes in saying something like, I don't think I have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, right? A reflection back could be as simple as you're not sure about the diagnosis of PTSD, Or if a client says something like, I've just been like this for so long, I think it's just part of my personality. A reflection back could be, all of this feels really normal for you. So reflections are generally statements rather than questions. And we use reflections in motivational interviewing to convey our empathy and our understanding, and especially to start seeing uh, the world through our client's eyes. So there are different types of reflections. Uh, Some are more complex than others. For today, uh, at least as an overview, I want to touch on the three main ones that we use. So a simplified reflection. Let's think of a simplified reflection to a statement. The three are simplified, amplified, and double-sided. We'll start with simplified. So let's say that a client says, I can't start eating like that. None of my family eats that way. So while we may want to argue a little bit and try to persuade uh, towards change, our goal is to align and to empathize. So we could say something like, It's hard for you to think about changing your eating habits because you're surrounded by people who don't eat in the ways that I'm suggesting, right? Another technique that we, that we use, which I I use as an example is called an amplified reflection. So going back to that statement that I I so often heard uh, when I worked in addiction, my wife is exaggerating. I don't drink that much, right? When someone says something from kind of a place of extreme, you have the option to enhance it, to, uh, to exaggerate it, to amplify it. So a reflection to a statement like that could be, uh, it seems to you that she has no reason at all to worry about you. And while it doesn't always happen, uh, this leaves open the possibility that your client's going to disagree with you in a way that leads them to change talk. Well, I guess she does have some reason to worry about me, right? And I'd say the main goal with an amplified reflection is that we want the client to disagree with us. We're making it bigger, hoping that they'll disagree because then we can build off of the notion that the behavior actually is somewhat problematic for them. And then lastly, another technique of reflections, the third, is the double-sided reflections. So let's say a client says something like, it really helped me to have a drink after I found out I got passed over for the job promotion. But one led to two, two led to three. Before I knew it, I was in the doghouse with my wife again. So as a clinician, I could say something back like, so on one hand, having a drink helped you cope with the disappointment uh, of not getting that promotion. And at the same time, you noticed your wife was unhappy, right? And what if the client comes back with something like, yeah, she always overreacts, but I know she's worried about me. I could repeat back, she's worried about you. So we use double-sided reflections. When we use them, we're really... Like we, we start with first talking about the reason not to change. And then second, we highlight the reason to change. What we're really doing is we're trying to show people that they're ambivalent by highlighting. There's part of them with, that would like to change, even though they're resistant, even though they're ambivalent. The one thing I would highlight here when we talk about reflections is the difference between reflections and confrontation. So 
say that the client says something like, I guess I do drink too much sometimes, but I don't think I have a drinking problem. So more of a confrontative statement would be something like, well, you do drink a pint a day, right? There's judgment in confrontation. We want to avoid that in MI. Something better would be, uh, so on one hand, you don't want to be labeled as someone who has a drinking problem. Yet on the other hand, you think you may be drinking too much at times, right? Or let's think about that client that says, ah, like my wife is so annoying. She's always telling me to stop drinking, right? Instead of a confrontation, well, she has good reasons to tell you to stop drinking, right? We'd want to say something like, you're really frustrated when she tells you what to do. So again, we're wanting to get to the feeling of what our client is telling us. What are their experiences and the examples that they're providing us with? So summaries, uh, this is our fourth skill of uh, ORS that leads us into change planning. So summaries in essence are long reflections of more than one client statement, right? So let's think about a man who uh, is considering permanent housing after years of homelessness. He's kind of in the ambivalent stage, largely because he's worried about losing his community uh, that he's been living with on the streets for the past five years. Is he going to find new friends in this new apartment complex? What's he going to do with his free time? Right. But then in the same breath, he says stuff like, oh, but my apartment is so clean. It's so warm. I really do love the way that it feels. Uh, I've needed to be inside for a long time. My body can't hold up much longer on the street. So a summary to statements like these could go something like, well, what I'm hearing is that you, you've been thinking about moving inside for a while now. There's a downside though, in that you won't be living with your friends anymore and you're going to need to meet new people in your building. You also worry about your health and you think it'd be better for your situation if you were inside, however. So summaries, they really give us the opportunity to become strategic in what we're saying um, and how we're guiding our clients towards healthy behavior change by selectively summarizing our clients' own reasons for change. That's why we keep all those little golden nuggets of change talk in our back pocket. We want to be able to pull from those when we need them. So in the next few slides, we're actually going to go over uh, target behavior, how to negotiate a change plan. Keep summaries in mind when we go over that stuff, because those final steps um, are really where summaries can come into play and be really, really helpful. The biggest difference that I would say between summaries and reflections is that we use summaries to transition. Uh, it's where we draw together what's happened before transitioning into the next step or the next task, right? So to think of a different summary for the same situation. So let me make sure that I hear you correctly. You applied for your apartment because you're worried about your health and it scares you to think about losing your community. And then you mention that your apartment is comforting, that you like that it's warm and it might be better for your health. So where does that leave you now? Right. So summaries are a really nice way of keeping our relationship and our rapport intact. Um, we're able to drive kind of and direct the conversation in a way that actually gets back to consequences of the problematic behavior. What if you stay living on the streets? Right. So it's I hear this and I hear I hear that. So where does that leave us? What's next? Coming into the actual change stuff. So let's keep building on change talk say we've identified the problem behavior, right? Through eliciting change talk, we, we know what needs to change. Um, so how do we parse out what a target behavior really is? And even more, how do we, what do we do actually with the, with the information when we have it? So a target behavior is what the client wants to change. It's the behavior that's targeted for intervention. And it's really what we use in action planning when we negotiate a change plan. So the thing is though, how do we move from evoking change talk to actually planning for change? Before we get into the actual change planning, it's important for us to recognize when we're actually supposed to start talking about changes being made, right? So when is our client ready to start planning? And even more, how do we continue to approach them from this place of collaboration when we move towards changing their behavior? So the first thing to look for is increased change talk. The more that we hear our clients describe their ability, uh, their reasons, their needs for change, the more we know they're open to considering how that change may actually occur in their life. So we should be listening for any uh, moments in which our clients language, so their message, does it have movement towards change? Uh, I think I'm going to do it. 
or I think I may want to change that behavior, right? We want to find the movement towards change in their language. And then also looking for moments in which they begin taking steps. So no matter how big or small a step, a step towards change is always, always, always a step in the right direction. And diminish sustained talk. So, you know, when we first start working with our clients, when they're stuck in pre-contemplation or contemplation, they're usually giving us equal amounts of change in sustained talk, right? And the, re- the result is ambivalence. It's 50-50. So when we start to notice change talk uh, increasing and sustained talk decreasing, that's when we know our clients getting closer to change. And resolve. So resolve is actually a harder concept to recognize. So this is basically looking for when our clients aren't overtly expressing their readiness uh, for change. So instead, they may become more quiet, uh, more reflective. They may even actually become tearful. It's it's a realization that change is setting in, right? When resolve happens, you'll notice it because it's like your, your client is feeling it. They're feeling really, really deeply for themselves. They're starting to consider change. And envisioning, this is where our clients really start thinking about the possibility of change. So it's like they start asking themselves, well, what can happen if I actually do change? You know, like what does change actually look like for my life? There can still be a lot of ambivalence mixed in with statements of envisioning. That's totally, totally normal. But if you notice envisioning happen, uh, it's time to start thinking about testing the waters for negotiating a change plan. So when a client says something like, it's going to be really hard to work out every day, but I know I need to do it, right? You can mix and match your different uh, MI skills to highlight the ambivalence around working out every day, while also reinforcing that that envisioning of positive change, of working out and what that means to your client personally. And then lastly, questions about change. So unlike envisioning, a lot of our clients aren't going to be able to imagine what change actually looks like for them just yet. And that's totally very, very normal. You know, I think we're going to see that more times than not. So we still need to pay attention to moments in which our clients express curiosity around change. It's good when they ask questions. An example of this could be someone who's in contemplation and struggling with substance use, right? They may ask you, well, how would someone go about quitting? Like, what does that even look like? So again, you're going to know that your client is ready to begin planning for change when you start to notice some of these behaviors happening. And that's really where, at least for me, the fun starts, right? Like people start taking control and responsibility for their decisions and their actions. They start working for change because they want to change it. They've identified their reasons. Okay. So testing the waters when we start to see some of those indications for change. So what do we do when we recognize our clients may be ready? The first step, recapitulation. Remember I told you, remember summaries, right? So this is recapitulation is basically providing a summary of all of uh, the change talk that we've been hearing up until that point. We want to remind our clients of their own motivations for change. I would say the primary focus here is really still it's on the change talk. It's helping the client recognize all of those reasons they've given for themselves and doing it in a way that's collaborative. It's on their level. We're a team. So you're helping them continue to move forward by summarizing their reasons in a way that transitions them to that next step towards that change, right? So with these summaries, recapitulation, comes that transitional question. Okay, great. We know we know why and how, or we know why you want to change. What's next? We don't know how yet. So this transitional question, it's not meant to evoke commitment, but I would say it's rather, it's, it's to help our client continue to reflect on their desire to change. Let's keep moving forward, right? We're testing the waters. We're summarizing things to make sure we've heard you, uh, our client correctly. And we want to make sure we know the why as we continue to look at this stuff. So we can highlight all the reasons that they've laid out on their own. So now you, my client, you have made all of your reasons for wanting to change. And I've just summarized those reasons for you. So now, what are the next steps? It's as simple as asking, so what do you think you're going to do? Right? And the final step, uh, the pause, which can be uncomfortable uh, when you pause, is it's silence. It's wait, wait for the answer. So after you've summarized, uh, after you have asked that transitional question, you have to be quiet. (laughs) 
wait for your client to answer. Give your client time to reflect and process what they want to do. Okay, so the planning process builds on those same skills that we're using regarding the engaging, focusing, evoking, right? You're still listening for and attending to change talk. The difference now, though, is that the change talk is going to relate to a specific change plan. So now we have that targeted behavior, uh, alcohol use, and we're planning for its change. Residential treatment that's going to lead to sobriety. So we're planning the behavioral intervention that will lead to behavior change. I would say in this phase, there's really only one new form of change talk that's introduced, and that's efficacy. So aside from thinking about the level of motivation, so how motivated is my client, we're also thinking about their, their efficacy, their confidence. How confident is my client? How much does my client believe in their ability to change? How likely is it that this plan will work? Our clients will choose to act when they believe that it's possible. It's just my opinion, but it's, I think, plain and simple. Like when they truly believe that they have a plan that's attainable, that they can do it, that's when change is going to occur. Moving into negotiating a change plan. So how do we proceed with change planning? How do we negotiate a change plan? So just because we're done evoking change talk doesn't mean we're done evoking motivation. Good planning really always involves that continual practice of engaging and focusing, evoking, right? So let's first think about a clear path uh, for planning for change. And you'll know there's a clear path when there's a, a clear path plan in mind, really, when, you, when your client has already made up their mind about how they want to proceed. So an example of this, and actually it makes me think of the very first client that we that I uh, used for that case example. So this would be a patient that is uh, hellbent on getting clean in an outpatient setting, despite the fact that our best clinical judgment might be saying, this person needs residential, right? So using that first case example and kind of building off of it, let's say that we have this, this, this patient, they've shown up to my office have, after having this super intense moment with this little girl uh, while he's sitting inside his dealer's car. And he is certain, he's positive, he wants to get clean. And he also knows exactly how he wants to go about his sobriety. He doesn't want to go to residential. He's been to resi residential 10 times in the past. He wants to come in. He wants to come in three times a week. He wants to check in. He wants to face real life stressors. So he can trust his ability to get through everyday stress while maintaining sobriety. He's super motivated, but I'm hesitant, right? He's been using multiple substances daily without any indications of sobriety. His housing is marginal at best. He doesn't have a ton of support. He's been using for years. So how is this going to work? So instead of fighting my client, I would use my reflections and my summaries. I would use my skills. I would say, so your plan is to quit cold turkey and come in to see me three times a week. And you always go to residential treatment. I, I totally hear you. You know, you want to get clean while you're engaged with the world. You want to stay outpatient. So what else? And let's say he comes back at me with something like, uh, well, I should, I should probably talk about my deployment this time. I think it's why I keep relapsing. I should probably come in for therapy after I'm sober. In which I could reflect back, okay, so after you've detoxed uh, and regained your sobriety, you'll start coming in for weekly sessions. And you and I are going to start processing some of those deeper feelings to try to figure out some resolve in coping so that we can protect your sobriety. Anything else? Well, yeah, I should probably get into groups too. It did help me in the past. It's, it's helpful to be around other people who are going through the same thing. Right. So, and I'll stop for a second. This is the best case scenario, right? Like, the, like it, it doesn't happen often, but this is the best case. He's walking himself and you through a change plan. Embrace this. If it's, if it happens, don't fight it. If anything, fight your writing reflex and roll with your patient, you know, see what they come up with and then troubleshoot your questions or your concerns by using your MI skills. One way that you can really gauge whether or not a plan is going to work is by asking your client to rate both their level of motivation and confidence on a one to 10 scale, right? So, okay, so our plan is for you to come in and see me three times a week to check in for a month. And after, we'll start diving in a bit deeper by discussing some of the reasons that you feel like you continue to relapse. We'll also get you involved in groups so that you have a sense of community and so that you're reminded there are others going through the same thing. So, on a one to 10 scale, how motivated are you to follow through with this plan? 
right? And then also on a one to 10 scale, how likely do you think it is? How confident are you in your ability to follow through? So asking your client to think about their motivation alongside their ability, it just helps to solidify an attainable change plan. If they rate their motivation at a 10, but they see their ability as a four, you can follow up with something like, well, a four isn't a one or a two, right? So it sounds like you do think this plan is possible. What do you think would need to change for your confidence level to increase to more of a six or a seven? So again, everything we're doing is with strategy. Um, Anytime we're met with resistance, we use our skills to help our therapy, to help our planning, to get us unstuck right? So that we can keep moving forward. Eventually, we're going to get to a place where motivation and confidence levels are high. You guys have a change plan. And that's when you start asking about next steps. Okay, awesome. We've got a good plan. So what's next? So now what if your client thinks the plan's super solid, but, but you still have questions? What do you do? So you ask them, bring everything up, right? Start asking about p- possible barriers. What could go wrong? What should we plan for in the event that parts of the plan go awry, right? Asking these questions, all it does is it mobilizes chain shock. It keeps everything moving forward for confidence and motivation because you're thinking of everything. The one thing I would highlight here, and I will probably highlight it again, keep your solutions at a minimum. It's so hard to do in this part, but keep the onus on your client. What is it that they themselves are coming up with? And how is it that you, as their provider, can reflect back their intention in a way that mobilizes their change? So there's also situations, we good? Yeah, there's also situations in which many paths can be taken. And actually the example that I just used is a good one to keep going with. So even when there's a clear path, it can involve a lot of different plans. It's important when you have a really big goal to think about What's the first step that we take? So the first thing we would do is when there are multiple components to a change plan is we would summarize the larger goal and identify really out loud all of the sub goals. So in thinking about this example, our client wants to get clean and stay clean in an outpatient setting, right? So our largest goal is maintaining long-term sobriety, but there's so much more that goes into that one goal. So one sub goal is gaining sobriety, right? That can be parsed down even into smaller goals. It's coming in three times a week uh, for the first month and then engaging in individual group therapy. And even the therapy, that can be parsed down a little bit more. What's the schedule that we have in mind when we're processing any traumas or emotional stuck points that threaten your ongoing sobriety? It's thinking about what's our best course of action and how do we plan for everything to the best of our ability, but how do we plan so that we're not left wondering What do we do when one step is accomplished and the next step needs to be taken? So in this third scenario, starting from scratch, which at least for me was was where a huge uh, amount of my, my patients were, we would always lots of times start from scratch. So this is where we've got a clear goal and no clear path for how to get there. So the main task here is you want to work together. You want to collaborate, you want to develop a change plan, all the while continuing to resist the writing reflex. Do not tell your client what they should do in this point. It can be so hard. At least it was for me. It can be so tough because, but we need to keep our overall strategy in mind, right? So it's, we need to pull from our MI skill and use our skills strategically to help our clients continuing moving forward for themselves and not for us, not for anyone else. I'd say the first thing that you want to do in this situation of no clear path is make sure you understand your client's goal. So if you don't have a clear goal in mind, you need to just spend some time continuing to understand their contemplation, evoke more of that change talk and clarify the goal first. Once you have a goal defined, though, that's where you really start to work with your client to brainstorm different options. Think of potential plans, potential next steps, right? What could our plan be? So what brainstorming does is it actually gives you guys a list to start with. You have a list to work with, right? Now we have this list of potential options. Now we can elicit the client's motivation and confidence for attaining that goal based on each potential option. Which one motivates you the most? Which one do you feel the most confident in, right? So motivation and confidence, they need to be high. 
for, for change plans to be successful. And, and even more, motivation and confidence need to be high for behavioral changes to actually be made. So which is the best option? Let's think about all these different options from all the different lenses. And I'm going to help you do that by using my core MI skills and keeping the focus on you, right? And before you know it, you guys have agreed on a path. Really, you've, nego- you've negotiated your change plan and your client can actually start taking those next steps towards change. And eventually, through hard work and follow through, their behavior will change. And why? Because they wanted it to change for themselves. They made changes because they decided that they wanted to change. Okay, so this was a lot to cover. I've been talking for so much. I hope that I have, I hope you guys are still awake. So uh, I think that for me, at least uh, in general, we've got a, a general understanding of motivational interviewing. This is usually at least in trainings for myself where I start to ask myself, how realistic is it that I'm actually gonna use these techniques in my day-to-day practice? So I thought a good thing to kind of end with is thinking about the different barriers that you guys may foresee in using motivational interviewing in day-to-day practice. So the poll, do you think it's habit or confidence? Feeling like I'm used to doing things my way, right? Or I only know how to do things my way. How can I start including MI at this point? Or is it acuity? My clients are far too acute for any of these techniques, right? Or time, how am I going to find the time to do this stuff with my clients? Or what about doubt? Uh, which I felt a lot, right? Feeling like MI just leaves too much of the process up to the client. So what do you guys think? All of these concerns are super valid. With the exception of acuity, all of these are barriers that can be overcome as well. So just to start out by addressing acuity. So the one caveat and the reason that I wanted to to include that in this, in the poll is motivational interviewing you know, it's awesome. The techniques can be applied to a ton of different situations. I really, really, truly believe in MI. I've just watched it do so much for so many people, but it isn't a one size fits all treatment. So you do have to keep using your clinical judgment when you're working with your clients. If you feel like their symptoms are too acute, if they're talking about self-harm or harming other people, if they're gravely disabled, um, if they can't engage because of cognitive impairment or some type of medical issue, MI is not the end all be all. You may not be using it with that particular client, right? So with regards to habit and confidence, this was a big one for me. So I'll try to keep it short. I would say though, it's hard to think about changing our routine and our habits um, and building confidence in new techniques. It's always best to start small and work towards incorporating MI at every single visit, if you can. So for me, what I did was I picked one skill at a time and I would practice that skill for a week. And if I felt like that skill was, was doing, I was doing a good job at it. I would try to incorporate additional skills. So it doesn't have to be all at once. What I would say is pick a skill and try it once at a time. Uh, It took me God, at least six months. And that was with consultation with people actually listening to my therapy sessions to really feel like I got it. So I hear you, but it can absolutely be learned. And we will practice some of of how to do this stuff uh, next week. So hopefully that will help as well. So time. Uh, One thing I will say is MI actually doesn't take any longer than other visits. And the first visit is really always the most important. There's actually a lot of research uh, that's shown that outcomes can be influenced by the very first 15 minutes of a visit. So I would challenge you to approach your initial visits with your clients. Think of them as laying the groundwork for your future rapport. Be thoughtful around the the way that you engage your client from the get-go, because odds are, if you guys can get on the same page from the get-go, it's going to save you a lot of time and energy as things progress. You're going to be more aligned. And then lastly, doubt. The easiest way, best way I can say it is it's a gentle reminder. So it's not your responsibility to make the changes happen. You're just there to facilitate the process. So your role is to help the client identify the problem. If and when they identify it, honestly, they usually feel responsible for their own change. What I would tell you is if you identify it for them, you're more likely to be met with resistance or excuses right? For their behavior, for that dreaded feeling that I think at least I felt so much was I'm working harder than my client. If you feel like that, 
reassess where you are when it comes to using your MI skills, because you want to make sure that you guys are on that same page and you're not giving too much in terms of what you're telling them to do. Resist that writing reflex. Yes, Christina, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, if we are at that time for question and answer, um, I just want to say, oh my gosh, wow, what a wealth of information you've just given us. This is phenomenal. Everyone, as I share this first question and comment with Christina, please do feel free to add your questions into the chat box. We've got a good 20 minutes here for a question and answer. So the first comment is, do you know how hard it is to overcome the notion that you know better than your client and you just don't understand how they see that? And then, and I thought this was like so astute, right? And then it's probably a lot like what we're asking them to overcome mm-hmm. in trusting us in the first place. Yeah. I get it. Do you yeah. want to comment on that for a bit? It's just so hard. It's so hard to fight it in terms of how to, I think for me, a lot of what I really started to focus on was the fact that at the end of the day, our clients are experts in them. It's not us, right? And we went into this work because we want to be able to help. And so if you think about how you help someone who is an expert in their life, you tap into their expertise, Right. You don't want to necessarily impose what may work best for you because that do, that's probably not going to matter to them. And if it's again, if it's not meaningful, it's out the window, you know, like it's it's not going to stick. And I think especially when you think of of ambivalence oh, yeah. and when you think of uh, which I, I really tried to highlight that ambivalence is the same as resistance in MI and in, in, in every MI training I've ever been in. The term is resistance, but it's ambivalence. It's not knowing which way you want to go, you know? And so that's okay. We're human beings. We never totally know which way we want to go. But if we can find something that matters to us and we have someone that allows us to really explore ourselves, it's just so, it's so meaningful. And the changes they say, I mean, most of my examples are addiction because this is where I use most of it. But like, it was so crazy when I left my job in addiction to really reflect and look at how many people had become clean, not because of me, but because of them, you know, because at the end of the day, it was just me trying to figure out in my own mind, what is it? Where's their conflict? How can I highlight for them so they can figure out what their next steps need to be knowing that I'm going to be here. I'm going to affirm them. I'm going to be here the whole time, but I want them to know that they can do it because at the end of the day they can. And I believe in that, you know, so it's a really, really, really great point. There are so many people who are posting to the chat box how powerful your presentation is. Oh, people are sure talking good. about um, the information that you're sharing being really great. They're talking about the stories and how powerful the stories are that you've shared. When we we step back for a second, we think about the crisis continuum of care and justice yeah. diversion. Yeah, I wonder if you could. I think it's been weaved through everything that you've been talking about. But I wonder if you um, have any stories that you might share with us about how motivational interviewing has been very helpful, specifically with the crisis continuum of care. When I was a supervisor, one of the things I would always ask my employees when I was interviewing was I would give them this case example and ask what they would do with the hopes that the main thing that they were going to do for this person in crisis was listen and validate, right? Because I think a lot of times the way that if you're in crisis, you're out of control, right? And not like your behaviors, like you feel out of control. And so understanding that, and I think that's where, for me, at least that's where our work is special is that we want to be those people that are in those moments with our patients when they're out of control so that we can teach them how to regulate and how to get back to a place of stability, right? And so I think with motivational interviewing, whether or not it just be simply validating what's happening, reflecting back what's happening to them so that they feel heard, you know? it. I used to say this actually when I was training for suicide prevention, like sometimes it doesn't matter what someone says. It, even if it's completely off the wall, whatever they're feeling is really what you're wanting to tap into. So like for, for suicide prevention, we'd have people at times that were really, really, really high and saying really bizarre, nonsensical things. That wouldn't matter. All I would just reflect back is, man, like you feel so out of control. I feel it with you. I'm here with you, but I don't know what to do next either. You know? And so sometimes I think just really putting yourself in a position where you're 
you're able to align with the patient where they don't feel alone, where they feel validated, where they feel heard, where, where they feel like we get them. That's at the end of the day, it's meaningful. And when it's authentic, like when you're really there because you care, they feel it. They really, really do. And I think part of MI is that the skill, the skill, it, it just has this ability to tap into how to really, really, really uh, see the world from that person's life because you're not giving them any of yourself. You're reiterating them, mm-hmm. right? Like you're reflecting back what's happening with them. And I think a lot of times for crisis, it deescalates stuff. And the weirdest thing that I actually never expected to happen is that when you deescalate them once, they're usually calmer when they see you. So if they're in crisis again, mm-hmm. they'll calm down again slower, you know, like or uh, slower, they'll calm down again faster. So like if, if they're in a weight room and, and they're just starting to really escalate it and the, the receptionist can't calm things down and you walk out and it's like, okay, my person's here. Just that context. That's where I say like, lay it from the get go, you know, lay it from the get go. And it, it sticks, man. It's just, it really, really works. Hope that helps. I think that there are so many of us who are reacting to these stories that you're telling and these off the cuff insights, because you are clearly such a seasoned clinician and, you know, that kind of knowledge is, yeah, that, that kind of knowledge is something that's developed out of actual practice. You can't necessarily read that in a book. Yeah, no, you Um, can't make it up. (laughs) And and I was thinking about what you were talking about, the story of bringing out the lotion and that factory um, grounding that happened and yeah. the memory of her mom and how profound that was. And, and that part of motivational interviewing, it seems also is about how the clinician readjusts themselves repeatedly, not just in relation to the client, but also right. in their own thinking of right. which direction it's really powerful. I'm seeing a number of other statements here and says that they're a little apprehensive just from not having confidence, confidence in it yet, but that they'll start trying to use it as soon as possible in their job, yeah. working mostly, mostly with people who are living with addiction um, and alcoholism. Yeah. And so motivational interviewing will definitely come in handy if they can find the confidence to use it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process of you developing confidence. And I know next week, just shout out for your next training is going to actually be the practice opportunity. Yeah. For those. Yeah, we're going to, it's going to be a lot of like just big group work where, and and the reason that I actually, I will say wanted to do it as a big group work is when I was learning and what I hope you guys get next week is I would talk to my colleagues about my reflections and like, what would you have said? And I mean, a lot of times in case conference and stuff, don't keep it all to yourself, ask other people, you know, and I'm hoping next week when we have, we're going to have like these 10 different uh, options for reflections and then using or skills and stuff. And I want you guys to see what every single one of you would say, because that's what helps to bring about ideas. What I would say for confidence though, I mean, I, I messed up a lot in the beginning. Uh, I had one client one time be like, I don't need you to tell me what I feel. And I was like, okay, (laughs) gotcha. You know? So I switched, I switched it up a little bit. And actually, am I wasn't super appropriate for that guy because it really did bother him when I reflected things back to him. So be humble, know you're going to mess stuff up and just keep trying. It's, I really can't highlight enough. Like it's not, it's a hard skill to learn, but it's, but once you start to learn it and once it starts to stick, it, it sticks. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're, it, like my poor wife is like, stop MIing me, you know, and I reflect stuff that like, it's something that becomes part of you. I would say in terms of ways that you can practice I would start with reflections. I like, I think that would be the biggest thing to start with. If you want to pick one skill and go forward, start with reflections because what it is, is it's forcing you to focus in on what the client is saying. Mm -hmm. And once you focus in, you have to think about how you would reflect that back. And over time, what you want to see happen is that your thinking becomes faster. So in the beginning, and I mean, so again, I, I was, I was audio recorded for my first six months. I hated listening to myself do therapy because I was so clunky, you know, but over time, I think part of what happens is when your thinking gets faster, your reflections become way deeper, you know, because you're like, oh, like you just said this. Well, I can think of all these different ways to say these different things because these are the feelings that come with that, you know? And so it's, I think it's pick one skill. If reflections don't feel comfortable, pick a skill that feels the most comfortable and start with that skill So you can show yourself you can do it because 
all this stuff, I mean, anyone who is in this field can absolutely do these skills. It just takes time and practice, but I do, I, I totally hear you. And I, I acknowledge that it's, it's, uh, it's much easier said than done. Another thing my dad used to say all the time. <laughs> he sounds like a really cool guy. No, 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 he was a therapist. Very, very <laughs> choice. Okay. <laughs> he was one totally of us. A therapist. Huh? One of us. Yep. <laughs> We were just talking a little bit about having realized that the, that the person that you were working with was not the right match for MI. And I, it makes me also think about culturally responsive practice and yeah. how in some cultures, when people come to a psychologist or a social worker or a marriage and family therapist or a peer specialist, they might come to that person with the cultural expectation that they will be told what to do. Right. And so that might be one of those places where thinking about culturally responsive practice Absolutely. might be really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you might talk about how you've experienced using MI with different communities. What do you mean by uh, different communities? Like different populations? Yeah, different populations, whether it's diversity in terms of um, race, ethnicity, or maybe LGBTQ identity or generational status or any other kind of social demographics that are about diverse populations. Before I was, uh, I transitioned into suicide prevention. I was uh, with just general mental health for a few years. I kind of, it was the last thing I did really in direct practice because I wanted to just be in a role where like everything came at me, right? Like it wasn't just one thing. And in many ways, the skills really do transfer amongst everyone. But I think the biggest thing that I would say is as you're learning what matters from your client, that's actually where a lot of that strategy comes in from the get go, because if it's if you have someone of uh, Filipino descent who comes in and who may be very rooted in their family. Right. And really have struggle with finding their voice um, in different types of ways. I think you use your oars to highlight those portions of what they find as culturally difficult. Right. And the way that a lot of ways it doesn't align because a lot of with the rest of the normative society, right? Like when you think of anyone from like a place of diversity, LGBTQ or a person of color, someone who, who doesn't, I hate to say it like that. Cause it's, it's the, you know, like the, they don't feel like they fit basically. If they don't feel like they fit, highlight that, let them know that you hear that. I had one guy that, that used to come in and he would get so, he would get so pissed because he would have to go to like three or four different appointments at the time. Uh, he was disabled. His mom had to take him to his appointments and he felt like he was just a ping pong ball, right? Like just going all over the place. All he wanted to do was be able to come in and talk about the fact that he was gay and no one wanted to give him that time to do it because they, he had to get his medications for his schizophrenia. He had to make sure that he was getting his follow-up for all the medical things that happened to him overseas, all these different things. So it's, it's finding the time and the space, regardless of what the, what the problem is, right? And highlighting the fact that if they don't feel like they align with what's happening. Um, so in terms of, I guess, communities of diversity, communities that may not feel like they fit, highlight that, acknowledge it, you know, acknowledge the stuff that's in the room. It's deep. It really like, it's a quick rapport builder because they're going to see like, oh man, like that person just, they totally just got it. You know, even if you don't fully get it, highlight that you don't get it. Tell them, you know, I don't fully understand. I'd like to learn more. Can you tell me, you know, tell me more about that. I, I want to know more stuff like that. That's, I would just say it's, it's always using the skills really to just highlight the feelings. It's always try to get to the feeling. That's MI. I can only imagine that being a client of yours means in part feeling seen. And that is such a powerful <laughs> oh, thing. I, no, I, I really mean it. Honestly, yeah. I, I I've both been a provider and a recipient of services. And so yeah. I know from both sides of that equation, yeah. how important that is to be seen as a human being. And yes, and I think and that's worthy. what you were talking about when you talk about you reflecting them back to them. Yeah. And you talked about how you're getting to listening to the feeling of what the client is telling us, not yes. just the words, but what is the feeling behind it? Yes. And with that, I kind of want to maybe more or less gracefully try and sneak over to this other really powerful question that someone brought up, which is about does practicing motivational interviewing over telehealth affect its, you know, impact its effectiveness in any way? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, please. I mean, this is, I, I don't have research that I can pull from, but I would say no. I, I would say when it comes down to it, motivational interviewing, whether or not it be in person or telehealth is, it's really your ability to 
to make someone feel heard that at the end of the day, like that, that's really, I think what it is. Right. And it's like, I, it makes me think of, so when I was in the, working in the prison, some, sometimes we'd have to, to cover for other prisons. Right. So sometimes I would do telehealth, um, especially up in Pelican Bay, they didn't have many uh, clinicians up there. So I would dial in, um, I was doing a lot of stuff in the crisis center. And so I would be uh, talking to these people who were also uh, in crisis and were, were in their, it's called the CTC crisis treatment center. Mm. And I would use a lot of MI because all that was happening all around them were the guards were telling what they needed to do. The guards were making fun of them. The inmates were making fun of them. They were told their JCATs for being in CTC and all these different things that were happening. All I would just say is, gosh, it feels like things are so lonely right now. You know, I'm really glad that I can be here with you because you do have this hour with me and you're going to have it again next week. And if we need to, we'll work something in this week, you know, stuff like that. And then other things that I would try to encourage them to do since I wasn't there. Um, I would often, especially in the prison journal, you know, and I, and a lot of them would really worry about other people finding their journal. So I'd be like, flush it down the toilet, get it out though, you know, get the feelings out. And if you're worried about someone reading those feelings, get rid of them and remind, remind me of them when you, when we talk the next week, you know, but I think for telehealth, it's the same premise. It's, it's the same premise of just needing to listen to what's happening for the client. If the client is like, Uh, like, you know, we're over, we're over the computer. This is weird. Can someone like listen to us? Like if, if the client's kind of skeeved out about being over the computer, reflect that back, you know, like it's super unnatural to not be sitting with you right now. Like I totally feel it too. Is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable so that we can talk a little bit today or it's keeping them in the driver's seat, making sure that they know what it is that, that they want to do and that you're there, you're along for the ride. You know, you're there to help guide them, not to tell them what they need to do. I hope that answers it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Let's see here. Another question. Do you have any advice for applying motivational interviewing when working with clients with significant mental illness, such as bipolar, schizophrenia, delusional thought processes, et cetera? Yeah. So this is, this kind of goes with that acuity piece of it. So I would say, make sure that, you know, as clinicians, the best thing that we have is our gut. It's at the end of the day, we got to trust how we feel. So if it doesn't feel like a client uh, that you're sitting with in the moment is able to potentially think from a place of insight and introspection, maybe hold off for a second. And if they can, then reflect back. So there was another, uh, it makes me think with severe mental illness. I didn't actually finish the certification because I became a suicide prevention coordinator, but there's this, there's this uh, therapy called behavioral family therapy. It's also an evidence-based treatment. It's like 20 sessions. It's a very, very long treatment, but the whole premise of it is really very rooted in my opinion, in motivational interviewing, because it's asking the person with the severe mental illness, uh, bipolar disorder, to teach their family members and the clinician what each of the actual symptoms looks like in their life. So you're sitting with a family member saying like, hey, you're the expert. You know what it feels like when mania is coming. You know what it feels like when depression is coming. What can I look like? What what can I look at? You know, what can I find when that stuff's happening in your life? What is it that you would have done? Blast, tell me about a time that this happened before, you know, like, oh, it's that one time that I spent five grand, you know, like that was a, that was an indicator. So it's, it's, it's putting them and keeping them in the seat of the expert in a way that's not pressuring them, but that's empowering them. Right. And that's that. I just love the empowerment part of this is like, it's so cool to watch people like feel confident in their ability to manage and direct their own life, you know? And at the end of the day, like this is none of this is ever about us. It's about them. So that's what I would say, like it goes with delusional disorder, I would say would be a little bit harder with MI because delusional disorder is it's kind of its own thing. But I think at the same time, you can engage someone using premise of MI, you know, like you can really let them know things don't feel okay for you right now. You know, like it really feels like things are no one is following you right now. Like it's, you know, not that could be a delusion. So no one is tracking what you are thinking right now. No one is is totally fully understanding you right now. I'm going to do my best, but there may be times where I disagree. And so I want to call that out, you know, because there's delusional disorder is, is pretty tough um, with MI, I would say it's, it's much more for me, it was much more case management and making sure there's reality testing. I would say, keep them in the driver's seat, keep them in the, they're the expert. You don't know. I completely agree with that. And um, when I worked with veterans who were living with schizophrenia, especially yeah. 
um, in a community-based case management program, my experience was that there were different um, kind of ebbs and flows with people's symptomology. And in certain moments, they really were in a place to respond well to motivational interviewing. And in yeah. other times, awesome. it yeah. was a little bit more challenging. So my, my own practice experience was not to necessarily write it off completely, yes. but to be in tune. And, and that motivational interviewing is a bit like a dance, right? For we sure. are moving with the client. We're not yeah. trying to push them. We're not trying to pull them. We're literally trying to be in lockstep. And so in order for us to do that, we, like you were saying before, really have to see them kind of where they're at. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm aware also of this idea of right now, COVID-19, wildfires in California, oh. power outages. The idea that maybe many of us are feeling disempowered is probably not a big stretch. Yeah. So if we are lucky enough to sit down with another human being for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, and they're engaging us in a way that helps us to feel empowered, yeah. what a gift. Yeah. Um, to have. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about motivational interviewing in this particular socio-historical moment. Yeah, it well, it, what you just said actually made me think of there's this what I would say is always take lessons from your clients because this is something that that a client of mine said often and and it has stuck with me. I think when so much is happening all around us, you have to narrow the focus. And so if there's an ability to really narrow in and be there with someone in the moment if they're have, having problems with COVID or wildfires, if that's the primary thing in their life, focus on it. Let them have that space to focus on it. You know, it doesn't mean like, even if you guys have this whole change plan, and this is actually something I might say it in next week's training, or I may have just thought about it, but I don't know, regardless, I, I may repeat myself next week. If, if you guys have this whole plan that's done, it doesn't mean it's not going to completely change while it's happening, right? Like it's like, it's life. It's what happens. So I think a lot of times expect to pivot rather than to stay static, right? Like you're always wanting to be dynamic with your patient. And so when it comes to things like COVID, and this makes me think of a lot of the crisis line calls that we used to get from the veterans crisis line in moments of extra escalation after the paradise fires, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You know, I may as well, why would I even keep living, you know, stuff like that. So it's, it's trying to figure out kind of what's the biggest thing since there is crisis happening and how do I narrow the focus so that we can first start somewhere. And then once we've started, how do we start to build from that so that this person feels like they have efficacy again, that they actually have the ability to be in control of their life, even though it feels like everything around them is completely out of control, which it may be. And it feels better to know that the therapist that I'm working with actually knows that and acknowledges that, that they're not just saying like, just get through it, you know, like, just do this, just do that. Like it's, it's okay to not be okay, you know, and it's important to tell your patients. It's, a, it's actually really important to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable because life is never going to be comfortable forever. You know, like there will always be things that kind of come in. So being able to really look at uh, how to manage that and then also how to model that through your patient. You know, like if you have a patient that's, I used this, there was one guy in, uh, when I was at San Francisco general that would always come to the ED and I, I felt like I gave him a lot of really good options and none of them were ever good enough. Right. So I finally at, at one point was like, okay, so these are actually just the three options. Which one would you like? You know, like, like we're not going to keep thinking about all of these different things. These are the three that we have to choose from because these are the resources that we have and we're here. We're happy to help and we're not going anywhere. Which one would you like? Or would you prefer to not use us yet? You know, in which case keep coming back. I'll keep giving you food. I'll keep giving you toiletries. If you don't want to live in one of our SROs, totally fine. That's your choice, but these are what we have. You know, so I think some of it is just, it's figuring out how to meet, meet them where they are. It, it's okay to not be okay. And and it's important that they know that because, because things aren't always going to be okay. It's just a, like a constant deluge of pearls and gems from you. I feel like Christina, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks. no, really. And I know that, you know, it's, it's one thing that when you're, when you're presenting, you're not able to see the audience, but I can tell from the comments that keep coming into the chat box that what you're saying is really resonating well. So one of the last questions is, what would you offer to clinicians who are doing motivational interviewing to stay grounded and feel confident in their skills and competencies? Oh, that's such a good question. Use each other. It's the, it's the best way that I, I mean, it's like now being an analyst, right? It's, 
I like numbers. I can't help it. I actually left clinical work for numbers and I love what I'm doing. It's, it's really exciting and, and very meaningful to me, but the connection that clinicians have is different from anything I've ever felt um, in any type of administrative role, right? I think that we go through things together in the field. And so in terms of needing to feel grounded, if you have a bad day, reach out and lean on your colleagues. Like that's, that's the, it's, it's, it's what's gotten me through a lot of things. Um, at, at the end of the day, when, when you're like, wow, like those seven cases kicked my butt, oh, every single one of them, like, I'm just so tired, you know? So come up with a plan for what you would do for yourself. Like for me, I grew up in San Diego. So I, I am, I'm a water baby. Like I, if I go and I sit by the ocean, I feel better. So I, that's what I do. If I really have had a bad day, I call my wife and I'd be like, Hey, I'm going, I'm going to go sit at the bay before we go home, before I get home. You know, like that's, it's, it's self-care in terms of what's, what can ground you because you can't get that from your patients. Um, and I think that's one of the really, really difficult things about uh, clinical work is that it's this, it's this balance between how to take care of yourself, knowing that you're half of the therapeutic relationship, but keeping it all focused on your client because projective identification is very, very real. And it's good to acknowledge that and to talk to your colleagues about the fact that someone just verbally vomited and projected a bunch of stuff on you. And that's going to impact you because you're a human being, right? So it's, I think part of it is just acknowledge the impact that your work has on you and lean on your colleagues when you need to go to therapy. If you need to, therapy is great. We're therapists. <laughs> It's good. Go talk about it. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more with that. And and one of my um, personal professional goals in life is to help to destigmatize yeah. mental health for mental health professionals, because yes. so many of us are really carrying a lot of pressures, especially in this current 2020 world right now. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say also, I wonder what is to the extent to which we can watch what can be felt as resistance or what have you from clients and the extent to which that they are coming up with their own change talk. And if those might be some of those indicators within MI that we're getting out of their way so that they're able to kind of be running their own show. Yeah. And so if we keep that as like the data points, yeah. that is a way to very um, kind of from an evidence-based perspective, yeah. assess how we're doing from yeah. the MI role. Yes, absolutely. Cause I think a lot of times I did change certain things around, but that was obviously very much based on a, a person that I worked with who just taught me, I mean, honestly taught me everything I know about motivation. Cause I was like, you can't do this outpatient. What are you like? You've been using everything for years and you have no real housing, all these different things. And he came into my office three times a week because I made time for him. And he threw up in my trash can three times a week for the first few weeks while he was detoxing. And then he kept coming. And he just kept coming and then he was going to treatment and he was, so, he just, he wanted it. And he, I remember like nine or 10 months after he had gotten sober and we were really doing some very, very meaningful trauma um, work. He was like, don't ever let anyone tell you that they don't want to get clean. Like, like, or that they can't get clean. He was like, they'll get clean if, if they want to. He was like, I've been 10 times. I just needed to get to that point, you know? And so I think part of it is just, it's just being, it's yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just being there. It's just being there. Thank you, Christina, so much yeah. for this presentation. Definitely. I really hope everyone who's here will join us uh, for the next session next week. Just a couple of end of, of the conversation here. We've got the resources that Christina has provided. We've got references. Thank you so much for those. This is one of these evidence-based practices that is really key out in the world right now. So thank you for all of these references. Thank you so very much for participating with us. Christina, thank you again so much. This yeah, was delightful. Yeah, for sure. Happy, awesome. to, happy to help. <laughs> Wonderful. We will look forward to seeing everyone back here next week. Same bat place, same bat time. As yeah. ever. Thank Have you so much. Have a good much. one, guys. Everyone stay safe. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.